Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church this beautiful morning. I invite you to prepare your hearts and minds for worship. Welcome, friends. We gather to worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We gather so that we can remember God's grace to us. Would you join me in the call to worship? In moments of anxiety, God leads us to still waters. Oh, oh God, God, we, we come, come to, to you. you. In moments of confusion, God leads us in right paths. O oh God, we come to hear your voice. In moments of loneliness, God is with us. O oh God, we come into your presence, seeking your love. In all our moments, God is with us. So we come to praise the one who restores our lives. Let us stand and sing together.
Friends, even as we are seated to feel that embrace of God's love, may our spirits and souls arise indeed as we lift our prayers to God. Let us pray. God, our maker, in summer we easily marvel at the world you have made. The colors of sunrise and sunset filling the horizon the intricate beauty of flower gardens and natural parks, the quiet dignity of a river in its course, and the steadfast presence of a rock face carved over time. You show us how each small piece of your creation depends in many ways on all the others. Summer growth depends on spring rains, Health for each creature depends on the wise balance you have set between each species. The quality of life on the respect we show one another. Wise and patient God, we marvel at the world you love. Our worship joins the songs of all creation to bring you praise, honoring you and the relationships you have set between us all. Through Christ, firstborn of all creation. Amen. And trusting in God's grace, let us join together in our common confession, praying, God, our maker, as we marvel at your creation, we confess we often take it for granted. We don't know what to make of reports about the damage human life causes. We prefer to live as if our lifestyle makes no impact on the earth. We confess we don't really want to change, yet we wonder if the way we live is pleasing to you. For all the ways we put your creation at risk and harm the earth, we ask for your forgiveness. Teach us how to live in this marvelous world with love and respect for you and for your whole creation. Trusting the friendship we have in Jesus and the grace given to us, let us open our hearts in a time of silent prayer. Friends, hear and believe the good news. Colossians proclaims that in Christ, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. God has made peace with us through the cross of Jesus Christ. So in Christ, all things hold together. May we accept the peace of Christ and make peace with one another in his name. The people of God said, amen. Let us stand. Peace of Christ be with you. Also with you. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace in whatever manner you are comfortable with, with your neighbor. <laughs> Oh, 
Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. It's so good to be gathered in worship here at the First Presbyterian Church of Santa Barbara. So good to be in person, indoors, and have our wonderful overflow seating outside and um, be in this space. It just feels wonderful. So thank you for joining us, and thank you all who continue to join us online in our evening um, YouTube worship service, and um, we're grateful to be extending our worship in this way. I wanted to remind us and invite us that we're a congregation that prays together. And in the pew rack in front of you, you'll actually see a prayer request card. And if at any point uh, you feel like, oh, you know, I'd really like someone to be praying for me about a particular thing, I want to invite you to fill this out and drop it in the offering plate that's going to be passed around later in the service. Uh, we take these very seriously. There's a, there's a prayer team that prays regularly for the needs of this congregation. So really, really, at any point in the service, pick out one of these prayer cards and fill it out. We would love to be praying for you and with you about the things that are going on in your lives. Many thanks to Sharon Chandler for organizing and helping to uh, lead the team that is a part of uh, updating our directory. Sharon will be taking pictures uh, today for people who uh, need them taken, and the sign-up sheet is out outside on the Fireside Lounge, and you, you can uh, have those today or um, in the middle of August as well. There's a date coming up, and that information and the new information for the directory is in your order of worship. So if you could fill that out and get it back to us, we would greatly appreciate it. We're looking forward to having something in our hands that has updated photos of us all. So thanks for participating. We're grateful that Pastor Charles is getting some time away. He's up in Portland, Oregon, enjoying some much needed vacation. So thank you for praying for him and thinking of him. We'll welcome him back uh, next week along with our guest preacher, Jeff Schaefer. We give thanks for the life of Brother Joe Blanton who passed away just this past Monday. And we ask that you would continue to hold Pat in your prayers as, they make this, as she makes this journey uh, without Joe in these days ahead. Uh, information on a service is forthcoming. And a reminder that the service giving thanks for the life of Jerry Willoughby will be held on July 31st, Saturday at 1 o'clock here at the church. And uh, invitation uh, to end this announcement time, my announcement times, for the Soul Food Midweek Dinners. These have been a great hit. Uh, we've had a food truck that's come, and it's delicious tacos from Moni's and lots of seating on the patio for the last two weeks. And for this coming week, we will have the Santa Barbara Petting Zoo. So if you need a little fix of something furry and wonderful and warm in your lap, you can go downstairs and join the kids and sit there and pet a little bunny. I can't tell you how cathartic that is, just to be able to take a deep breath and pet a bunny, or you can hold a turtle as well. <laughs> All sorts. We're great. Hannah Croshaw has done a great job doing some, uh, some hand painting and arm painting, and uh, grateful for her work. And it's just a wonderful time. Live bands and live music all four weeks in July accompanying our, our food. And thanks to Aaron for arranging that. So come and join us. Uh, 4.30 to 6.30 or 4 to 7 is sort of the wide window. And uh, come have some food and enjoy some fellowship. There's a lot of people here. And we'd love to have you as well. Speaking of Aaron, Aaron has some updates from our sanctuary renovation team. Thanks, Aaron, for uh, bringing us up to speed. I am Erin Bonsky Evans, your Minister of Music, and today I'm here to announce some exciting developments on behalf of the Sanctuary Renovation Team. Since we have been worshiping indoors, you may have noticed some distinctly familiar seating that has made its way into the CFC. Of course, we all know these are some of our pews from the sanctuary. They have been carefully and gingerly relocated for use in our current worship while we work on some subtly wonderful upgrades to our sanctuary for our future worship together. The word sanctuary is defined in the dictionary as a place of refuge and safety, a feeling we are deftly familiar with when we reflect on the experience of our worship together at First Pres for the last 150 years. We are so grateful that we steward that heritage of our great sanctuary into a legacy for the future of our worship here at First Pres. And I have the distinct pleasure to serve alongside the other members of our team, Fred Marsh, 
Eric Wiebe, Paul Tarasik, Chuck Curtis, and Steph Olson to do just that, to preserve the wonderful legacy of our past while gently shepherding our facility into the future through subtle improvements that will enhance our worship and community for many years to come. These improvements include upgrades to our audio system, which has largely been completed at this time, installation of a hearing loop, video cameras to record our worship services and events, and new lighting and flooring, the same colors, the same sanctuary, just refreshed and ready to house and facilitate our worship. You can think of it as a spa treatment of sorts, or a nice thorough detailing of your car inside and out. We have signed contracts and will begin work in the next several weeks, starting with some light carpentry and electrical work to set the infrastructure while we wait for materials to be delivered. We are extremely grateful for the generosity of all of you, our donors, who are making these much needed renovations possible. I want to give a very special word of thanks to Bill Wagner, who is here today. Um, Bill Wagner pledged a wonderfully generous gift to ensure there were enough resources for us to accomplish our goals. Thank you so much, Bill. If you would allow, uh, if you would like to know more about, yes, let's, yeah. If you would like to know more about what we are working on, there will be a display board out on the patio after the service, which outlines some details. And now that things are really getting started uh, to move forward, we'll soon be tracking our progress on our website and in our weekly e-newsletter, so keep an eye out. This is the update from the Sanctuary Renovation Team, and we look forward to a time in the not-so-distant future when we'll return to worship in the sanctuary again together. Thank you again for your generous support. Thank you for tuning in to our online service. Just a reminder to like this video and comment and share the piece in the live chat if you can. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to our channel. It really helps out. Please pray with me the prayer of illumination. Move among us with your spirit, O oh God, and prepare our hearts and minds to receive your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing you, we may obey your will and follow your ways in the examples of Jesus Christ, the loving word. Amen. The reading for today is taken from Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 to 6. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people, it is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you will not attend to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnants of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their folk, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer, or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord. Amen. One of the many things that feels so good to be back to besides in the room is to some familiar practices that we have, one of which is singing our psalm. So we're going to sing our song responsively today. How about that? Psalm 23 is our psalm. The refrain is written in your worship folder. You can remain seated, but let us um, sing these wonderful scripture songs together. Yeah. 
Friends, we open Mark's gospel again this morning, and we're stepping in midstream to a series of harrowing events shown to us throughout this sixth chapter in Mark. The chapter started with Jesus sending out his disciples, the apostles, in order to extend Jesus' ministry. They were given his power to heal the sick, to speak the truth, to speak the truth in love, and to speak it in a way that lies and deceptions and all that suffocates and strangles health and wholeness is cast away, which is them casting out demons. They do the same kind of work that they have witnessed Jesus himself do. And for most of the chapter, that's where they are. They're out doing that work. The interlude, the fearsome interlude in the chapter is John the Baptist, the great forerunner of the Messiah is cruelly beheaded. Among other things, this beheading goes to illustrate how in this chapter, the followers of Jesus who are all in, like those disciples who are sent out to preach and teach and heal, if you're all in, you are not guaranteed safety or kind treatment. Quite the opposite, actually. 
You should expect opposition from a cruel world if you are all in with Jesus. Being a disciple of Jesus is not the easy road. We hear in this fearsome interlude of John's beheading a kind of waiting and expectation for the resurrection work of Jesus to be, to be made known in dark times. So this morning in our text, the disciples now return to Jesus. Those who have been sent, the apostles, come back. They've ministered among the regions, they were scattered, and now they relocate. They are road-weary, they're tired, and they're eager to tell Jesus about what they have seen and what they've done. Interestingly, the lectionary text highlights what, highlights what happens in these verses, and it skips over what we think of as the major content here, the feeding of the 5,000, the miracle of Jesus walking on the water and calming the storm. No, today we just have these two little snippets of text to reflect on, and I think it's for good reason. So would you pray once more with me? Lord Christ, we wait and we watch and we listen now for your life-giving word. Your presence and your words are why we've come. So we ask your blessing and the work of your spirit to unfold. Shepherd us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. From Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 34, and then 53 to 56, let us hear the word of God. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now, many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. And as he went ashore, Jesus saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. And when they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Outdoor adventuring getting out for a rest. This aspect of our life together culturally has experienced a rapid rise in popularity, and that was even prior to the pandemic. Outdoor adventuring was big and getting bigger. But with the closure of so many familiar forms of gathering and recreation, it was like the pandemic threw gasoline on the fire. Everyone, Almost everyone, it seems, wanted to get away to a deserted place and rest a while. My sister and her family on the East Coast, they've enjoyed this thing called overlanding for a number of years. It's the thing where you outfit a big truck with rooftop tents and you take the road less traveled. You stay self-sufficient for days on end with food and with fuel and my sister's family, they've gone on some extraordinary trips, gone some amazing places, breathtaking beauty, truly isolated locations. And they were doing it before it became wildly popular. 
So they too have watched as interest in this activity keeps climbing and climbing. It's all too true. We live in a crowded world. And so getting away is all the more attractive. It's an increasingly crowded world and we are increasingly familiar with the implications of our crowded populations. Our use of resources, our approach to our own proximity to each other. It can feel like we're a bunch of sheep bumping shoulders in a tight pen. So, these disciples in our text who are tired themselves, who have bumped a lot of shoulders with fellow sheep over the last many days, they've gone out to do the good work of healing the sick. And they come back to Jesus both exuberant and exhausted. I envision them to be much like little children. Look, 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 Jesus. I want to tell you what happened. No, I want to tell you what happened. Listen, listen. I get a chance to uh, lead chapel time with wonderful Chapel Beth pretty regularly. And it reminds me, this text reminds me of these preschoolers that I work with and sing songs with. You ask one person a question, like, what kind of pet do you have at home? And they answer, and then suddenly, every other child in that group wants to answer as well. Immediately, all the hands go up. I have a bird, I have a dog, I have a kitty, and you can't get them to stop. I kind of imagine that's what it's like for Jesus to hear these childlike apostles come and tell him the stories of what's happened. It's just buzzing. And they're wanting to tell Jesus, and they also kind of aren't totally aware at how much have been, has been taken out of them. But Jesus knows. Jesus listens. Jesus knows how tired they are, how taxing it is to be engaged in that kind of all-in, every hour, every day kind of ministry. Because Jesus is the good shepherd, not like those shepherds in Jeremiah that get chastised. No, Jesus is the quintessential model. He is the good shepherd. And without the text even telling the story of the feeding of the 5,000, we see Jesus shepherding these disciples who've returned. He shepherds them with love and compassion and great tenderness. Jesus knows what they need when they need it come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. It's a beautiful four-part invitation. It covers all the bases. And that's point number one for us this morning. When we find ourselves tired and spent, having journeyed through difficulty or in the real thick of it, Jesus shepherds us. And not only, not only us individually, Jesus shepherds the community, all of us bumping shoulders like sheep. And with childlike ears, we can hear that call of the shepherd in our lives. And we can wonder back through our own histories, how have we heard and felt Jesus shepherding us? And how do we feel that today? that shepherding presence and that tender care that leads us to still waters, that brings us to green pastures. And I love this next part of the text because it's so true. What happens when we're heading for rest and restoration, when we see the green pasture just ahead, but the best laid plans get foiled? It happens in the text. How many times has it happened to you? Because it sure happened to me when it feels like you just need to get through the next thing, just cross over into the green pasture and you can take a break. But right at that moment, you're headed to that point of relaxation and release and something comes in from left field and you've got to regroup. It's amazing that this is a truth that's witnessed in this text. 
the disciples are, are headed in that direction, but the crowd meets them there. Their silence, their quietness, their rest, utterly interrupted. Jesus' intention to care for the welfare of his disciples is clear, and we, we believe it happened eventually. They got there. They got to a place of restoration, but the needs of humanity come streaming in. They come crowding in and pressing in, and Jesus, who himself is very tired, finds it possible to respond with compassion. It's an amazing scene. The disciples and Jesus just sitting serenely in this boat. I don't know how you picture it, but I picture the water being calm, the blue sky and the clouds overhead. They're just, they're just glad and reveling and ready to go to this quiet place and be restored. But all around the edges of the lake and the surrounding towns, people are just buzzing. They've heard about this Jesus who speaks with authority and the spirits obey him and his words carry the weight of heaven and his light casts darkness out. And as soon as they glimpse Jesus in the boat, they're just itching to be near him and have him attend to their needs. The text says, there at the shore, they begged Jesus. Wherever Jesus went, they begged Jesus. In Greek, it's an amazingly wonderful and diverse word. The word is perikaleo, which means coming alongside or to call to one side. So they were calling to Jesus, come alongside us, please. And it's used in multiple times in scripture for the ways that Jesus is called to. The leper calls out, perikaleo. Jairus, the synagogue leader with the, sinner, with the sick daughter, calls out, perikaleo. Jesus, please come alongside. It's no wonder then that the same word is the word that Jesus uses for the Holy Spirit, the paraclete the one who comes alongside, the promised companion, the counselor who knows our every need, the advocate. This word in Greek is so rich and wonderful, we could dwell on it for a long time. It's in John's gospel that Jesus promises to send the spirit, the one who will walk beside us, the one who will come to our aid. They begged Jesus, perikaleo, come alongside, and he did. Will you please companion me, is the cry of their hearts, and in some ways is the cry of every one of our hearts in different seasons of our lives. Can I be in your presence, O oh good shepherd? Can I hear your voice, not the drowning shouting voices of this world. Can I have you attend to my needs? Please, companion me, come alongside. When we operate from that place where we're open and honest about our dependency, we take on the name of Jesus. We come to be known as people that Jesus shepherds. And there's a funny thing that happens. You can't keep that word in for too long. People start to find out that Jesus is shepherding people, that the good shepherd is doing good work. And people start to take note. Oh, that's a group of bumbling people that Jesus shepherds. His work is going on there. We literally bear the name of Jesus as Jesus shepherds us. Oh, that's Jesus' flock. Which leads me to um, reflect on some of our church-wide, many, many churches, the, the wider church. There's a movement um, that's going on that, where we ask the question, how can we be more attractive to select groups? How will we get people to like us? Lots of churches ask that question, and it's not a bad question. What can we do to be more attractive to young people or to young families? 
And I've got to say for me, though, that that's not the primary question. The primary question is the one we just heard. How is this congregation, this community, bearing the name of Jesus? How are we being known as the flock Jesus shepherds? And how do we witness to that? Because that's the most primary thing. It's not about us picking up a bullhorn and shouting anything in particular. It's about the fact that Jesus, when Jesus' work is done, you can't keep it in. People come running. There's a commentator, Pete Perry. He says this, and I wholeheartedly agree. When a congregation bears Jesus' name, all sorts of people come seeking healing. People who are sick, people suffering from addictions, people who experience mental disturbance, people who are poor, people who are powerless, people who are considered socially or religiously unacceptable. People come, and they come to be shepherded by Jesus, just as the community is shepherded. In the text, the people stream in because they know this to be the group of fragile human beings that are shepherded by Jesus. They know his trustworthy voice, and they respond. And all sorts of things start happening from there. It's the place of security, the sanctuary that we talk about, the feeling of safety, the absence of fear, that place of security, knowing the shepherd's voice, and that's the place from which we are sent out. We dare not go unless we go from that place because we are sent to engage a broken and a hurting world, not with our power or influence, but by the power of the Spirit. The broken issues of people then are brought into the midst of this flock that Jesus shepherds. And they are manifold and many and unceasing, it seems. Broken issues come streaming in. School systems struggling to educate, social services overwhelmed, prison systems complicit with dehumanizing practices, political systems bending towards injustice. It all comes in like a big, blundering mess all of it calling out for a good shepherd to guide it and lead it. And we, as the sheep of Jesus' own fold, get called to engage the pressing issues of the day in our community, in our world, in the global picture. That's why we're connected to global mission partners throughout the world, so that we can stay connected and hear how God is working and we come to understand more fully what it means to bear Jesus' name. That's the flock that Jesus shepherds. And I admit that the needs for compassion can be overwhelming. They come crowding in because it's a crowded world. But the assurance and the promise is this, that we have a good shepherd who is sorting it out. That's the shepherd's work to do. And he invites us to be sorted out ourselves so that we can bear his name into the world. So the message of the text today is the importance of hearing the shepherd's call to rest, to take a breath when it's needed, to find relief in him, and to trust him, even if that relief gets set off a little further. When we find ourselves in Christ his work is borne out in this world. You know, the text says the people were desperate to touch just even the fringe of Jesus' clothes. Oftentimes, people who wore fringes on their clothing were considered holy, a sacred practice that's part of the tradition of Israel and is part of areas of uh, Hebrew faith still today. The fringe of the clothing being a representation of the holy. And indeed, Jesus bore heaven into this world and all the power of it. 
So we'll end on this note. As a church of Jesus Christ, people who come to this community, we bear the name of Jesus. We recognize God's power here, the the shepherding of Jesus. And in so many ways, we are the fringe of the clothing. We've been known as the church to be the body of Christ. And I'd like to extend that and say we're, we're the clothing of Christ too. And we're the fringe. People long to touch even a piece of Jesus. And when they do, they are healed. So as people who know that power, may we continue to be shepherded by Jesus this day and in all our days ahead. Amen. Would you pray with me? We're grateful not only for the image and the story, O oh Lord. We're grateful for its reality and the power that has broken into the world because you, Lord Christ, have set foot in it and seen fit to shepherd it. So shepherd us, we pray, in Christ's name, amen. Please stand to join us in singing, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy.
You may be seated. Indeed, it's out of a much gratitude for this limitless abundance of God and God's faithfulness and his blessings that we offer to God, a, a portion of what we've been given so that God's work might be done in this world. We are invited to spend these moments uh, as we hear and listen to this wonderful music, moments of reflection so that we can think in our hearts of the blessings we've received and allow the Holy Spirit to guide us in our gratitude. This is the first time in a long time we're having an offering and an offertory in the worship service. And so we're getting back in familiar with some of these practices. And uh, we thank the ushers for coming and waiting upon us and the plates that will pass amongst us. Amen. <laughs> Oh 
We continue in prayer. Uh, please pray with me. This is a responsive prayer. When you hear God in your mercy, we respond, hear our prayer. So let us pray. God in whom we live and move and have our being, as we are gathered in your presence today, we are aware of many challenges in our own lives, in the lives of those we care about and in the world around us. Thank you for your faithfulness to each of us and to your whole creation, given all that we share and all the different situations we face. Show us how our care and concern for the world and for each other can respond to the needs we name before you today. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In faithful silence, we lay before you the concerns on our hearts this day. We pray for those suffering from flooding in the eastern half of our country and in Europe. For the victims of fires in the western states and for the firefighters. For those in our nation coping with excessive heat, especially the poor and elderly. And for fellow Christians suffering persecution in so many places around the world. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are suffering in our community and for those who are ill and those who are bereaved. Those struggling to make ends meet or find the right job. Those who are lonely and those who are moving in, moving and in need of new friends. Those struggling to find housing in this expensive city. And those families divided by politics bless their efforts toward reconciliation. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our pastor nominating committee and its seven members. We pray for our congregation as we emerge from the pandemic and yet are concerned about a potential return to it. Help us see where, you're, where you call us to reach out with your love and generosity, sharing the faith we have in you. Equip us to meet every challenge we face with hearts full of faith and commitment. And now we pray as Jesus has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So our final hymn will be, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
just wonderful. Friends, the good shepherd will supply our every need. So in this week ahead, all the more hear and heed his voice. He has the life and the healing that we're longing for. And it's the same thing the world is longing for as well. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion, fellowship, and counsel of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. The people of God said, Amen. Amen. Let us be seated and prepare to go in peace.